So, Series 8, what are the episodes within it? The Christmas special is really the beginning of Series 8. A character called Jasper spending the night in a church on Christmas Eve, and he's interrupted uh, by uh, a rather annoying couple also spending the night. It's really a ghost story. We wanted to lean into the M.R. James tradition of a, a very atmospheric, spooky ghost story. We see why Jasper wants to be alone in the church. He's got these particular reliquary that he's trying to find, the jawbone of St. Nicholas. And um, he comes a cropper in the end, as people do when they try to steal these ancient relics. The church location was a great atmospheric find, wasn't it? It was really beautiful. The art department had made it so Christmassy. We filmed it in September, but it was very cosy inside and, and really evocative of what we wanted, which was to tell this creepy ghost story. But it looked beautiful. Paraskevi Decatriophobia is about a man who is terrified of Friday the 13th. The um, fear of that, the phobia, is called Paraskevi Decatriophobia. We thought it was a good title. And it's about a man's uh, fear of that day and how he can try and avoid anything bad happening. One, two, three. Good morning, Mr. Magpie. I'm sorry you're on your own. So now I've used up all my sorrow, nothing bad can happen. Understand? I play Reese's wife, Dana. I'm increasingly worried about his phobia, so I enlist uh, the Amateur Dramatic Society to come in and, and try and help him with the help of a doctor. Where did he get her, Sylvia Young? No, but she is on the waiting list. What I really love about Amanda in this episode is she's so unselfish. She wasn't trying to showboat or anything, and she gives everything to your character, and it's a really unshowy, unselfish performance and, and brilliant because of that. You really feel for this woman, and you really warm to her, and then it's a cruel twist of fate that we have given her, but um, we thought it was a funny ending. We were like, well, what's everyone like cringing for? It's, it's hilarious. He puts the brolly up inside, which is the last test for his kind of like, he's got over his phobia. And as I leave the house, I'm fiddling with the umbrella and I get hit by a car and die. So we're just about to film it and I have a stunt double who's going to do all the hard work, <laughs> make it look like I've done it. I'm incredibly superstitious, so I should be crossing my fingers that everything's going to go according to plan. We shall see. It is a dangerous stunt, that's why we've obviously got a stunt professional. She'll have pads on, but you know, you've got your head and other elements that are exposed, so I think the, the key element is keeping your head away from the concrete, so you kind of need to know where you are in that movement. It was a technical exercise filming that, wasn't it? You just wanted to get it right, because there was only it was one shot of me sat in the foreground and she gets knocked out down outside. And there was some jiggery-pokery with Amanda walking around and then a stunt woman swapping and flying into interview. The character is in the lounge and that's where the camera will be looking through so we've got a limited window if you like of what we're seeing visually so we need to see uh, the bonnet come into shot so we'll get that coming in at speed which will probably be around here so that'll be a stop mark which is very precise and it has to be there. It all plays out in, in this area really choreographed in such a way that Nadia won't roll out of shot and she'll be still in position when we call cut. Got there. The power of superstitions is a very intriguing thing. My character has to break a mirror at the end of it, and I was really pleased that I didn't actually have to do it. And what's that about? I mean, it's stupid. You don't want to tempt fate, that's what it is. I guess. Like, if, it, if there's any part of it that's true, you are you're inviting it to, to go wrong, aren't you, by doing it? I don't think anyone would walk along, see a ladder in the, across the, the pavement and think, I'm going to, I don't care, I'm walking under it. You'd always walk around. Some would, though, I think. Who are these nutters? I don't know, they're no longer alive, so. Oh, well, yeah, exactly. And now you answer. <laughs> In the last weekend, we play a couple uh, going away to a holiday home. One of them is seemingly uh, very ill with a life threatening disease. Speaking as a director, working on their stuff is, is very, very exciting because you can see the pictures in your mind as soon as you read the script. The good thing for fans of Inside Number no Nine is it's largely about just the two of them, Reese and Steve, and that makes it interesting, I think. 
There was a lot of line learning in last weekend. There's one big scene, there's a big argument. This silly argument escalates into something more serious. Do you not think I'm angry at the life I've missed out on the past nine years? If you're not quite on top of it, you can't do the performance as best as you could do it, and you'll always be kicking yourself that you didn't quite know it well enough. We're very comfortable working with each other, rather than working with a new actor where you'd have to explore a bit more. Because we've written it, we know what the motivations are. So our writing time is also our rehearsal time, in a way. It's like working with a couple of concert pianists or finely tuned athletes. To work with them is to work with two people who are absolutely the top of what they do. And it's demanding, but it's really enjoyable to do that. The mud bath was a thick mixture of gunge. I could barely get in it. When I actually finally got into it, I was on top of it. I couldn't get my backside down to the bottom of the bath. It was freezing cold, it had a hot water bottle pushed into it for my comfort, and I got a rash after it. There's a lot of paperwork involved in this case, can't really go into it. <laughs> you know, there's lots of questions. <laughs> that was fine, was totally fine. I barely even needed a shower. It was all very neat and tidy. It was a horrible death, wasn't it? It was. It's going to be a long, slow, process. I mean, you cannot imagine a worse death. Just slowly being eaten by small insects with your body encased in concrete. It's not, not good, is it? You yeah. won't choose it. Welcome to the comedy that is inside <laughs> number nine. Yeah. Oh, so exciting, because it's one of my favourite programmes, and it's just thrilling to be part of it. These boys write beautifully. Boys, how patronising that sounds. I didn't mean it to be. You pick up a script and the words are sayable. They're written with love and understanding and you're not fighting to try and find a meaning in them. I went through it all when I lost Fraser. Not everyone feels the same thing at the same time. We never write characters for particular actors. We knew we wanted a Scottish voice for sure. I thought Sheila will absolutely be brilliant in this role and I think she gives a great performance, doesn't yeah, she? Yeah, she's great and uh, it's almost a red herring because you think she's such a ray of light and hope within the episode that you think she's somehow going to come along and save the day for the, this couple. And sadly she doesn't. She's not the angel of light. It's something else. <laughs> They keep you dangling, dangling, dangling to the last possible minute. And then whew, the end result is always a huge sock in the tummy and surprise. And you think, oh no, and it's terrifying. It's so frightening as well. That's what's so wonderful about these stories. I have nothing but admiration for these writers. That is a wrap on Sheila. In Mother's Ruin, two brothers meet back at their dead mother's house to try and find out where the mother hid all her money. They knew she had lots of money and it becomes a very sort of spooky occult-like tale that then involves a pair of horrible gangsters as well. It felt a different episode, that, because you sort of get two halves. You get a sort of scary first half in the dark and then the lights come on when they come back from their holiday and there's this second half that's equally as brutal. It transpires they're even more horrible than than our characters. You'd had an injury, so it was quite fortuitous that we were tied to chairs with not too much movement. Yeah. The parrot was very well trained, quite sentient. I was amazed that it could fly so deftly in, in around the room. I had to carry it in the cage and it was quite frightening because it was really loud and, and I thought it was going to try and peck me and then I would have lost a finger, but it didn't do anything like that. That's where she was. Why? Because it really matters, Harry. We didn't know what accents to do, actually. We didn't know whether to leave all the cockneyness to, uh, to Phil and Anita, yeah, yeah. who have it running through their DNA. And we were a bit nervous about attempting cockney. southern accent, shall we say. Not cockney, but, yeah, um, but we thought it would be wrong to, to use our own accents. They were great as a couple, though, because it felt exactly what we wanted, wasn't it? As far as playing scary types, they just have it. We're so pleased they said yes. <laughs> no, Annie. We're still together, aren't we, Reg? Yeah, yeah, well, she ain't got rid of me just. Yeah. Love is a Stranger is really a sort of exploring the exciting world of online dating, which we don't really have any experience of, but uh, we wanted to tell a story where you were watching people exploring that Zoom culture that we've all become used to over the past couple of years. Hi, Vicky. Nice to e-meet you. Claire Rushbrook as a Vicky gets a, a cavalcade of quite horrible um, potential dates. One that you actually probably wouldn't want to spend any time with <laughs> is Manny. <laughs> Steve's character, no, he's not. He's nice, but he's ginger. <laughs> um, so 
that rules him out. My character, I think, Norman, he's looking for a carer. His set of requirements are just about how someone will look after him. He's very insensitive and blunt. He'd like going out with me. <laughs> I just need to know if you have direct transport links to Kettering. This is the one that we had so much back and forth with the script, trying to hide the fact that Vicky is the murderer. And we were thinking, are people going to be on to it immediately that she is the Lonely Hearts killer and it's not a man that's coming round doing it? The email said that we had to keep things anonymous, what with everything in the news. Well, statistically, you're more likely to be killed by someone you know than a complete stranger, so let's live dangerously, shall we? Ultimately, we decided that it gives the episode some jeopardy and some threat if, if you say up front, whoever she's going to pick, one of these people potentially is a killer. I think once the dates start, you almost forget about that. Yeah. And, and you focus on, on, the, on the individual characters and, and where each of these dates is going. The character I played, Manny, he seems like he's making a connection. She seems to really like him. And then, of course, the door opens and his wife comes in. Norman, you almost feel sorry for him. He's yeah, just lonely. Yeah, he's just lonely. Francis Barber's yes. character. Leslie, she's the funniest, but the most brutal as well. Then you've got the character of, of Jai, played by Asim Chowdhury, who we don't get to see his face for a long time. We see that he's got this sort of Port wine stain on, on his face and maybe that's why he's so shy and Matt Horn's character Edgar he's interested until he realizes two minutes in that he's not that sort of dismissal at the end is so brutal they're all pretty horrible so there were lots of little twists and turns within each of the the dates and that made it quite interesting from a narrative point of view but you don't get all the characters all the way through you know you've just got your one moment haven't you and it's quite an unusual structure for an episode in that regard. And the last episode is an episode called Three by Three, which is a very different episode. Steve and I are not in it, and it's a game show, basically, hosted by Lee Mack. We had written five episodes. We had one still to write. And it was actually my daughter, Holly, said you should do a quiz show. Just one episode comes on, and it's the most brilliant quiz show you've ever watched. And we kept coming back to this notion because it would be so different in amongst the six episodes. And then it was the exercise of how do you hide a story within the mundanity of a normal quiz show. And essentially the drama is the actual quiz itself and then will they answer the questions. But can you tell a story within the little bits and still make it appear that it would all have been broadcast? That was the challenge to ourselves. That's why we decided not to be in it. That's why we decided to hire someone like uh, Lee Mack to be the host who, who did a brilliant job. I'm sorry, it's Rhode Island. You do lose £100 and you are frozen. A quiz show in itself is quite dramatic and, and you do get drawn into the different characters. You get drawn into who's going to win the money, are they going to get the final amount. So within it, you've got a natural uh, structure and that appealed to us. One of the big exercises all the way through it was just really watching the contestants and, and looking out for any acting, you know, any point where you think, I don't believe that we would get them to go again or slightly pull back off something so you don't spot it. We didn't want it to be a fully scripted episode. We wanted there to be uh, improvisational elements. And we had to go about casting people as the contestants who weren't household names, who hadn't done much TV before. And, and that they would be able to improvise with Lee and build up their characters and, and he'd be able to throw things at them that they would respond with. We were in the, in the gallery watching it with all the cameras filming all the elements. We could go again as many times as we wanted, but we wanted this sort of spontaneity and truth but also wanting to make it cut together like those multi-camera quiz shows. It was a, a fantastic process and especially odd for us to be on the outside of it. It's the only one that we have just sat outside of the whole process and, and looked in on. For all intents and purposes, once it's put together, Lee completely did it like it was a genuine quiz show and you would not be able to see the cracks in the, in the process. Right at the end when it becomes very dramatic, even then I think that there were moments in it that you sort of buy the, the tension that's been building. We just had this crazy idea that one of the contestants would have um, sort of parapsychotic and uh, telekinetic. telekinetic abilities and that we wanted to end with, with a, a head explosion in a soundproof booth and, and, that, and that's what we did. Hopefully it will be a successful experiment. <laughs>